This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by three awesome people. Ellison Cook, Super Inframan, and 36 Dingo. If you want to help support the show, become a Patreon at wheredidtheroadgo.com. You get extra stuff all month, shows a week early, and much, much more. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have back Mr. Red Pill Junkie. Buenas noches. And Christopher Ernst. And good evening to you all as well. And uh, this is uh, sort of a wandering the road edition. There were a couple things I wanted to talk about that people have left comments about. And uh, one of them is UFO related. So I, I definitely wanted Red Pill on for this in particular. Um the other one, it's, uh, I mean, I guess it kind of leads into that eventually. So one of the comments I hear a lot about where did the road go is that people will say, oh, you've re-enchanted my world with this stuff. Like, and I've been getting that since we started, you know, the show back nine, almost 10 years ago. Like regularly people will say that, like you've re-enchanted, you know, my interest in this stuff, you've re-enchanted the world. And then every once in a while, I'll get someone who's like, you're just a debunker trying to disenchant everything. Hmm. And I started thinking about this, and the last comment I got like that was on the one we t- where we talked about the skull uh, that you know the guy claims is a Bigfoot skull. Mm. And okay, yeah, I'm like okay, but we, and so we do we do debunk that stuff. I mean, we've obviously gone off on the you know uh, to the stars mm-hmm. and how they were not going to produce anything worthwhile, and they didn't. Uh, <laughs> they didn't change anything, and I mean it's not it's not so much being a debunker as much as just looking at history, this stuff repeats again and again. I mean, how many times have we had people claim to have Bigfoot bodies? Yeah. 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 And I realized what's happening is I'm disenchanting the people who are very set on a being true. Right. You know, they're very set on, on Bigfoot being a flesh and blood creature or UFOs being extraterrestrial. And so when we're debunking this stuff, honestly debunking this stuff, it's disenchanting to their view of it. Because they're enamored with it at that point, whereas mm. other people are tired of it because nothing has come of it in all this time, and we're offering yeah. new variations on these ideas. Right. Yeah, I think that's very well put. And I feel bad that you know that anyone gets disenchanted listening to this show, but we're also not going to just play along with whatever the pop culture thing of the week is. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why most people who listen to the show, I think that's what they like is the fact that we don't do that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's certainly what I like about the show being part of it and listening to it. So that leads into another comment I get. I've gotten both, both hostily and friendly. Like um, people get upset that we dismiss the ETH mm-hmm. and we do, we totally, you know, like when we're talking about this stuff, like uh, I know one of the ruder comments was like, Oh, you guys are totally fine with fairies, but not extraterrestrials. <laughs> And I don't, I think that's partially that they don't understand. We're not, okay, except for maybe Josh, we're not literally talking about fairies. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that the, the wealth of fairy lore out there fits the phenomena better than an extraterrestrial um, right. explanation does. Not that we think it's actual fairies, but that right. that model just seems to be a little wider and more encompassing when you look at it yeah i think that's what you know that's what this field of research was called you know people who were interested in a lot of what we are seeing now and again this is not i i will say very frankly i believe that there are extraterrestrials out there um you know in fact there's you know uh, the 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 weird stuff I always contribute from the uh, uh, Sufi and Vedic mystics that I have knowledge of and met in India. There's the specific thing they talk about there being eighteen thousand planets with human like uh, um, uh, beings on it, which I've always found very interesting. That numerous people have used that number. Don't know what it means, but I think that 
the the phenomena as we have been sort of witnessing out on earth this thing that has gone back that is still happening that a lot of times people do attribute to being you know extraterrestrial or whatever the ufo phenomena it was called you know fairies or angels or you know arguably jinn possibly these yeah. are all i think you know that was just the name for it at one point yeah, um, variations uh, on a or theme. at least to argue that argument can be made that 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 is yeah yeah i think that what we're trying to do in in shows like this is not so much to poo poo the extraterrestrial hi hypothesis but just to point out how like uh, chris is saying this phenomenon has been interpreted and reinterpreted along uh, uh, across the, the the ages as different things you know either the gods angels the fey folk uh, and now we're calling them extraterrestrial visitors and just to point out the hubris of and dare i say it the arrogance of the people who say oh no this time we got it right yeah you know, yeah. those other guys that preceded us, no, they they they, they were dumb. They, they, yeah. they didn't understand. They didn't understand the phenomenon. They didn't have, you know, like the advantage of our big brains or, or, or all the research <laughs> that we've made. But now we're 100 percent sure. Now we know what we're talking about. And yeah. maybe a thousand years from now, you know, someone will be able to actually listen to, to this recording and say, oh, my God, you know, these guys thought. Uh, they, they, they knew what UFOs uh, were all about. They, they, they thought they were uh, extraterrestrial visitors. And maybe a thousand years from now, they will have a totally different uh, interpretation of the phenomenon, and maybe they won't. They won't be any closer. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. Back, back in the 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 three thousand years ago, they called them UFOs. What do you mean? Oh, you know the Glorps. Oh, the Glorps. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out they were experiencing the same things, but for some reason, they thought they right. were extraterrestrial. Yeah. <laughs> They're clearly from uh, the the subterranean jungles that we've discovered. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> I think I think many people, including people that have been uh, uh, guests in this show, have said you know or have uh, imagined the idea of the alien spacecraft finally landing on the White House lawn. And one of the first questions uh, asked by reporters is, oh, so why didn't you, you know, contact us all those years ago that people were reporting flying saucers and UFOs? <laughs> and the visitor will say, oh, you have those too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't know what they are either. <laughs> I uh, Exactly. I, I feel like, I mean, part of the thing is, you know, people are like, well, you dismiss the ETH. Well, I do that because I feel like it doesn't fit all the, I don't think it fits any of the parameters well. Like, other than people saying, I think I dealt with space aliens, there's not really, you know, most UFOs disappear. They don't shoot off into space uh, or they go into the ocean or they do things that, that you wouldn't expect a spacecraft to do. Not to mention that, uh, you know, who knows what kind of tech would be required to get here yeah. from another planet. Uh, and you have how many different types of craft and supposed aliens showing up on a very regular basis over the course of hundreds of years? I mean, it's not unlike humans to think that we would be that interesting. But really, why would we be this hub of activity without any, con any direct contact or any obvious goal being there? Right. And also, I mean, let's be honest, like one of the reasons why people... Uh, support the ETH is because they are only interested in the possible technological aspect. Right, right. That the phenomenon implies the idea that, well, you know, if they are aliens from another planet, so they clearly are right. highly more advanced than us. Right. So maybe by studying them, we can study, you know, their scientific advances, learn more about it, and with luck, reach out to their level eventually, you know, like uh, trying to learn uh, from their science. But to me, that's kind of like 
if you were interested in sex and the only thing that you focused on is like in lubricants, sex toys and condoms. <laughs> but oh, hey, what about, you know, actual orgasm? Oh, yeah, uh, 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 I don't I don't I don't, know, I don't care about that. <laughs> Never had yeah. sex with a with a partner. <laughs> <laughs> the, that's um, an excellent that is an excellent metaphor i'm I'm gonna keep that one in my brain <laughs> <laughs> um and the thing is yeah I don't, I don't have a problem with there being extraterrestrials whatsoever i think there's probably life everywhere including in our own solar system uh yeah. and that we are probably not able to recognize it because i think life will will come in such a variety of forms and we're looking for basically stuff like us and stuff that you can find on Earth. And even stuff you find on Earth that sometimes, like octopi, octopi uh, are very, yeah. very weird. And so when you look at another planet like Jupiter or something, who knows what would evolve there uh, that could right. be very intelligent life and may know we exist and be like, yeah, we're not touching them. <laughs> mm -hmm. At the same time, if you look at ideas of panspermia, if we're all kind of pushed, you know, if there is a whole bunch of planets that have been seeded uh, from whatever means, then, yeah, there might be other humanoid life out there that's similar to ours. Um, I mean, the universe is so vast, it would seem like it would be likely. It doesn't sure. necessarily mean that we'll ever find them or that, right. you know, they'll find us. So I don't, I don't dismiss the idea that aliens could come here, that we could interact with aliens. Um, I'm not sure we'd recognize it if we did. And yeah. as far as what we know of the UFO phenomenon, I think there's numerous things going on. One of them could be extraterrestrial, but I find it unlikely. I think there's there's various things that, that create this phenomenon. I'm not talking about misidentifications, but different elements that come together to create a phenomenon that looks similar, but is actually a number of different things. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the same way I could say, you know, I, I have no problem with the idea of a flesh and blood ape undiscovered in the Himalayas or the depths of the Pacific Northwest. Sure. Um, sure. But I think it would be a very rare thing to find. And the fact that nobody has found a body in all this time, that we don't have any actual physical evidence that is definitive at this point, suggests to me that that is not the answer. Could still be out there because there's plenty of, especially the Pacific Northwest, has areas people have probably never been in. You know, and the mountains of China and the Himalayas are vast wildernesses where something could hide. When they did the, the studies in India, they found, they took all these hair samples for Yeti uh, and they found a new bear that they didn't know existed. Right. So it's entirely possible that there is an intelligent ape out there, but I don't think that explains most Bigfoot sightings. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also the fact that uh, the the researchers, the mainstream researchers in cryptozoology and ufology, they have this tendency to leave out data yeah. that they find irrelevant, unimportant, uninteresting, and to us, the people who are interested in the high strangeness, that's the juicy stuff, you know, yeah. like that's the thing that we probably should be paying far more attention that, than the easy things, you know, like, yeah. oh, yeah, radar detection, metal samples. Oh, good. But what about the things that uh, don't pan out or, or the things that seem to uh, go beyond our understanding, not only of physics, but our understanding of uh, of reality, yeah. understanding of how, how consciousness works? Uh, Recently, I, I saw Mick West, you know, this famous uh, debunker and, and skeptic, putting some kind of, uh, of a poll on Twitter, asking the UFO Twitter community whether they would think that in order to get disclosure, uh, researchers and people should just stop talking about the stranger aspects of the phenomenon, like, for example, the things that happened when Ossad was studying the Skinwalker Ranch, or well, allegedly happened, because, right. to be honest, none of us know if that's the case at all. But these things about portals opening and, and shadow people lurking and werewolves and, and dino beavers and things that when you tell people who have really no cursory knowledge about the phenomenon will say, hey, 
I mean, I thought we were talking about like alien spacecraft and you now you're bringing up poltergeist phenomena. What does that have to do with anything? Yeah, yeah. I think we it, know that is hell. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that this is the uh, this what's playing out in a lot of ways is still that struggle that you find coming out of like the Enlightenment where, you know, it right. was science versus religion. And for a while, you know, these people who were scientists and were trying to look at things from an empirical standpoint and use the scientific method rather to uh, discover more things uh, that, you know, they were battling against religion. Uh, and, you know, these these ideals that were sort of embedded within the empires themselves. And I think that, yeah, we're still kind of like trailing out of that where you have some people whose whole mindset, you know, it's it's hard enough for them to get to a place where they can even believe that there are extraterrestrial beings that could be coming here. And they've gone that far. They're not going to go so far as to believe that, you know, I, and I'll use the term woo because it's used pejoratively by a lot of folks, you know, that there's all this stuff that, you know, doesn't make sense and is, yeah. you know, n not based in any sort of materiality. Um, and some of it, unfortunately, the problem is, is that there is a lot of like junk out there. And this is the whole, you know, if you want to get too deep into the larger trickster phenomena, but you know, this, the, the new age guy, um, blue avian, you know, UFO yeah. approach. I mean, that's, it's, <laughs> you know, that's a whole other, like, uh, there, and that's correctly a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, hogwash, let's say it, you know, to be nicely, to be, to, uh, to say, to put it nicely. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I think that in that kind of environment, you get people that, uh, have a real hard time. You're right. When the, their, uh, the enchantment of something that they've found to be like real and righteous, uh, uh, kind of goes away. Yeah. Or they, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the ancient alien thing. Oh. I mean, you know, I think we, we all at one point probably found the ancient alien idea fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then yeah. the more you look at yeah. it, the more you're like, huh, no, yeah. that can be explained. That doesn't really point to ancient aliens. That's, you know, yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't mean there weren't. Right. I mean, there are some odd things out there, but not as many as uh, people who like that theory would like to have you believe. Yeah. yeah and just because be they use very out outdated models. Yeah. You know, just yes. like, for example the people who were trying to search for proof that there was a dinosaur living in the Congo, you know, and Mokelo yeah. and Bembe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because they were using this 19th century uh, model of the prehistoric world, you know, the dinosaurs, that thought, okay, these animals are so big, they will only be able to live in swamps in order to support their weight. Yeah. And now we know that that's not the case at all. You know, that even brachiosaurus or you know, sauropods, the biggest animals that have walked this, the, 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 this earth, they didn't need to, to use legs to support their own weight. They were perfectly capable of doing so. So we have, we still, trying to use this Arthur Conan Doyle lost world uh, romantic idea of, oh, yeah, there's an, a, a, a living dinosaur uh, living in the jungle, just like the ancient alien guys are using this 1950s outdated B-movie type uh, sci-fi ideas about uh, how advanced civilizations would visit other planets and maybe even try to conquer or, or instruct the inhabitants of the, of, of those planets. And it's kind of like uh, silly. Oh yeah. They will need this long runway. Right. You know, just yeah. like in the, the space shuttle needed a long runway. That's why they had to build the Nazca lines. I mean, give me a break, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're already up, up, up past that. Thanks to Elon Musk. Right. <laughs> Um, and the thing is, I mean, we don't know what tech these, these cultures really had. They very well could have had flight, you know, I mean, go back to pre ice age and we may have had very advanced cultures that would have been wiped right off the face of the planet. Yeah. And those don't need to be alien. Yeah. I think the certainty with which, uh, there, a lot of, uh, the Academy says they know how things, you know, went 
And maybe they yeah. do on like a big macro scale, uh, you know, through uh, fossil evidence and, um, you know, uh, all of the wonderful things that you can do with the scientific method. But we really don't know no. that much. And it's it's, you know, again, it's that hubris that's which is a perfect word. Uh, it's been plaguing humans since uh, the dawn of time, uh, uh, as I remember from my Latin class in high school, <laughs> uh, hubris. Um that you know, uh, yeah, that we don't we don't know, we really don't. So there could be so many variables that we have not yet seen come into play, or are not aware of, don't have the capability of perceiving, don't have the equipment of perceiving. Um, you know, uh, you think of something like a film like uh, uh, Annihilation and the way that they deal mm. with this, I, I, you know, the concept of other life. Uh, yeah. You know, I think these. Yeah. You know, and at w what the impact too? If you were to put any, you know, uh, if you're going to put anything behind Rupert Sheldrake's uh, morphogenetic field, that you know, if you have more human beings acting in a particular way, like you, if you have all of a sudden, you know, uh, the entire northern hemisphere started meditating and doing sigil magic in a sort of synchronized way, is that going to change the environment? Is it going to change the environment if we start using different metals? We start using different geometries to build our cities and things yeah. like that. Is that going to change the way we interact with the environment? You know, could be something as simple as that. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, and also the idea of what do we mean when we say the advance? Mm, By yes. what metric do we judge the level of quote unquote advancement or progress of a culture that is different? than ours right right we we say well there couldn't have been any culture that was more advanced than us in the present date because archaeologists haven't had haven't found uh like the stone age version of an ipad right, <laughs> Something right. like that even though that I, I know that right now soraya will like to you know bring up the antikythera mechanism which is one <laughs> of our most favorite mysteries but Regardless, that's more it's, modern, it's, though. Exactly. But yeah, this idea that it is our way or the highway, that it, it is a culture needs to follow our same line of uh, development. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we don't consider them to be advanced. Like, yeah. oh, uh, if you don't build a, a, a power station, you're not advanced enough. Why? Why do do you need uh, a power station? Oh, we need a power station to to you know power all our gadgets, uh, our, our things like uh, television. Why do you need a television? Oh, we need a television to entertain ourselves and to see things that are go you know um, thousands of miles away from us. Well, <laughs> maybe a, a culture will say, well, you know, we don't need that because you know we can use like our psychic abilities and yeah. we know exactly what's exactly. happening. Yeah. You know, on the other side of the planet, and we almost as if we, we were there, like uh, astral projection or whatever. So, mm -hmm. if you n really master astral projection, why the hell you don't need uh, televisions? Why the hell you don't need uh, you know cameras or, or telephones? Yeah. If you, what do you need a telephone if you, if you know telepathy? Yeah. The um, and the thing is, whatever happened at the end of the last ice age wiped whatever was here away. I mean, yep. it, it, it inundated, what, 300 to 400 feet of the coastline around the world, which is probably where most cultures would build the, most of their stuff. Not to mention that, right. that the interior areas were racked with earthquakes and volcano act, volcanic activity and who knows what else, plus massive flooding. So, I mean, anything that was there was, aside from like go Gobekli Tepe, which was buried, yeah. is just gone, yeah. you know? Yep, yep. I mean, yeah. and they're still discovering even recent cities. Like, they essentially discovered, uh, 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 it's, I think, was it Dwarka recently? Yes. Uh, Rama City? Yeah. yeah. They, like, legitimately came out with, okay, yeah, this really is it. Um, uh, well, we like to dismiss ancient people's writings. Right. So, I mean, that was yeah. one of the things with Graham Hancock, looking at all these these ancient Indian texts and saying, look, they're saying these things exist, and piece by piece, we're finding all those things. Yeah. But archaeologists are like, no, that's just, you know, stories. That's just mythology. It's not real. And, you know, Western texts, same thing. I mean, how many cities that are mentioned in the Bible have we now found? 
Yes, it's the argument that uh, the late Philip Coppens, who was one of the original ancient aliens guys, used right. to say how there is this uh, paradox of uh, the people who go against the ancient alien theory and call it racist. Uh, justifiable so by saying, well, uh, just because modern uh, Westerners don't know how to build something like, I don't know, the, the Great Pyramid or Inca walls or whatever, doesn't give you the right to say it was built by aliens. Right. And I mm -hmm. get that, yep. yes, you know, because you are diminishing the prowess and the intelligence of uh, different ethnic groups living in different parts of the world. It's the same thing that, that kind of like the same argument that I was making uh, moments ago. But at the same time, you are also falling into that same uh, uh, level of paternalism, if you will, when, like Philip Coppin said, you are dismissing, Soraya saying, the accounts of these people who yeah. said, no, we we didn't build these, right. you, you know, monuments, like, yep. you know, yep. Native Americans saying, we didn't build these, those mounds. They were there when we arrived to these lands. Sure, right. And, you know, and, and archaeologists said, no, 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 you build them. You know, you just don't remember <laughs> or, or, you, or, or you're, you, you're misinterpreting your own lore. Yeah, uh, the Machu Picchu, which you know the the Aztec was it the Aztecs that they put that one on the Incas, Incas, the Incas, that's right. Yeah, and they're like, no, we didn't build that. You know, they we they couldn't even get the blocks up there that were a, a smaller size to try and repair it. Mo most of those, I mean, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this because you might know more about it, Miguel. But like, uh, if I'm remembering. Uh, what was the book? Um, oh, Artie Six Killer Clark's book when she went mm. around and spoke with a bunch of people in uh, uh, Central and I, th uh, I think Central America and then like maybe the yes. sort of northern part of South America or um, yeah, the closer to the equator, closer to, I don't know. She might have been in, I don't remember exactly where she went. However, in a lot of those, point being, I f uh, remember pretty correctly that I think most of the tribes that were there, most of the ruins asserted that either they built upon them, their ancestors built upon them, or they were there before. And right, this was like right. across the board, mm -hmm. most of them. Yeah. 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 Like, for example, uh, now we're, we're talking about Mesoamerica. There is these very impressive uh, archaeological ruins in Mexico, in, in, in the... Uh, southeast and Maya Peninsula, Uxmal. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and the legend says that Uxmal was built on a single night by a dwarf, you know, one of those alushes right. that are very that have become become very famous. And obviously, an archaeologist, an anthropologist, will say, "Well, that's just just mythology. You know, that's the 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 thing that uh, part of of these people's religion." religious ideas and and yet i find it very interesting that such ideas have a, a strong resemblance to the ideas of the hebrew people when they say that king solomon used uh, demons oh, yeah. in order to build uh, his yep. temple in jerusalem yep. Yep. you know because they were they couldn't he couldn't build it with you know, just uh, human labor. So he learned magic in order to trap these uh, demons to do their his bidding. So <laughs> I guess I guess my point is uh, it's a very fine line between being too literalist with uh, ancient mythology, the same way that uh, ancient alien theorists uh, uh, do. And at the same time, be, being a total dismissal uh, or dismissive of, of, of these ideas like yeah. modern anthropologists and trying to accommodate yeah. those uh, mythologies into a quote unquote sensible, rational framework. And I feel like a lot of times it really comes from this sort of Hellenistic uh, bias. Like it was the Greeks that were kind of or at least within modern research it was the greeks that were 
uh, I guess, idolized by the Europeans. And so mm. mythology in many ways, unless you're talking about, you know, obviously people who are working outside of like the European or American stranglehold on things. And I think there are plenty of people that are working probably from the countries where those mythologies are coming from. But for, at least for most of the past century, dominated by European and American uh, mythologies that in many ways, I think, over fetishized uh, Greek and Roman to the point that they were like assuming that that kind of uh, uh, symbology was going to be the same across other mythologies. And I don't think that that's necessarily something that can be, you know, you, you know, mythologies might have similarities, but they're not going to be um uh always the same they're not going to be always uh like the way in which the greek mythologies worked were very much part of the mystery schools and were part right. of this this symbolism and not to say that there isn't going to be symbolism across all mythologies but it was a very specific thing where yeah. like they had to be these clouded uh in very non-literal um myth these myths uh, uh, that were these these almost riddles to be figured out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now getting back to the original question that propelled uh, this discussion, the idea that uh, by poo pooing on the ETH, we are quote unquote uh, <laughs> disenchanting the UFO phenomenon. Uh, we've been talking about all these fascinating subjects about myths about different cultures, ancient cultures, ancient knowledge, about uh, psychic phenomena, paranormal phenomena. To me, that is far more interesting and enchanting than just saying, no, UFOs are alien spacecraft, yeah. end of story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, to say UFOs are not alien spacecraft, there are something else, is not to diminish the uh, magic, dare I say, of the phenomenon. On the contrary, is to ex expand it and to make it far more interesting and to see not only that, but that it connects with all these other mysteries and you keep pulling, we are trying to keep pulling on all these threads and see we are find, finding more and more connections and, and, and I think that's the purpose of it all. I mean, Soraya has said it again and again, and, and I, I agree 100% with the statement that the main purpose of the UFO phenomenon seems to be just to recognize that we don't understand how reality works. Yeah. That's a, that, that's supposed yeah. to be a stepping stone, you know, that, that the first step, and see, because with ETHers, they, they say that the end goal is just to have the governments of the world admit, oh, yeah, UFOs are real. Yeah. And they say, oh, yeah, we finished the, the, the race. Hurrah. No, man, you just finished, like, the first leg of the race. <laughs> it's a marathon. <laughs> and, just, and, and you just, you know, rushed it to the first kilometer. <laughs> now, if we look at something like, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, but the Auma uh, 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 the asteroid. More, there. more. That's more, it. More, more. <laughs> now that could be an actual extraterrestrial creation. Sure. You know, that's its behavior yeah. was odd. It was against anything we know. There could be a natural explanation for it that we don't understand, but at least that suggests that this might be how we make first contact with an extraterrestrial yeah. race. And, you know, Valet was the one that pointed out the problem with UFO reports is there's too damn many of them. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. if there was one big UFO you know, report every 50 years or something, that might seem more like extraterrestrial activity. But when you see that not only do these things happen regularly, um, they seem to have very personal effects on people, and they are cross-culture throughout written history, the idea of an extraterrestrial race being behind it for me, doesn't make sense, and I could totally be wrong. That's the thing. No, like, no, you're you're right. Even, even mm -hmm. Alan Hynek used to raise that argument against the ETH. You know, I, I, contrary to what people might think, Dr. J. Alan Hynek, who was the, the former head scientist of Boris Bublok, was very much against the ETH. He, he thought he, he didn't pan out, and one of the arguments he raised is the idea that. Uh, the UFO notes doesn't seem to stick around too long 
where they land their craft. You know, they, they stay there. They see that there's a farmer or a, or uh, some uh, some kids from a school uh, observing them, and they pick up their things and they leave. Yeah. You know, now rem- think of uh, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin visiting the moon. The first time that that man can visit the moon, they stay there for 21 hours. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't like pick up their things and leave after 10, 15 minutes, which is what it's our backyard. 90 percent of UFO landings last. You know? Yeah. So you will think, okay, yeah, they came up here from the uh, solar system that is. 10,000 light years away from more, but they only stayed the heat there for 10 minutes. Oh, okay. This is not taking into account all of the completely sort of unsubstantiated uh, uh, mythology that has been put together of like, you know, the deals made between Eisenhower and the Greys, sure. you know, which is to say like, I, and I'm saying that merely because I think there are some people out there that would say, well, what about that? And for the most part, I don't, that's not something that I think has any veracity to it. Any of those, you know, deals, uh, the, the deals with the alien grays for abduction, you know, in, in, uh, what is it? Uh, what do they give us? Transistors, stuff like that. Yeah. Velcro. Yeah. Velcro. Yeah. And I, the, the, the argument that Michio Kaku has raised that when, then there are construction workers putting a, a new, uh, you know, highway road and there's uh some kind of like uh, ant colony nearby they don't stop all work to try to establish diplomatic relationships with the ants <laughs> and try to explain right. to them yeah right. sorry we're going to have to destroy your ant colony because we need right. to build this road but don't worry we're going to like try to take you to a new place and also we're going to try to give you you know maybe one of our shovels <laughs> a pickaxe <laughs> so that you can <laughs> use that to, to build it the, the, the new colony <laughs> you know and the again like bigfoot the complete lack of anything substantial evidence wise you know the few things we have that that seem to be left behind by this stuff turn out to be very terrestrial even the exotic materials that like valet and stuff commented on they 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 are things we could make here on earth although we don't have any good reason to make them mm-hmm. i i find that to be even more fascinating yes. because it makes me think about like i mean yes i know everybody thinks that we've mastered our world and that you know the fact that somebody like Elon Musk exists, who I think is a, is a dingbat, um, personally, <laughs> uh, you know, means that we are able to control physics, you know, to the extent, you know, there's not really not much else to figure out. But I don't think that is the case at all. No. You know, and and yeah. and it's it, what you're saying. I think just think case in point, Soraya, right there. Yeah, we 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 know very little about again how reality works, where we are. We we have maybe figured out how to work with the common elements of reality, Mm -hmm. you know, but like it doesn't explain all the things, you know, and the vast number of things we don't understand. And I will still go back to, you know, we're still stuck on dark matter. Yeah. And test after test, you know, shows no, no evidence of dark matter, but we won't let it go because we have it figured out. Damn it. We just need to find it. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, we haven't figured out the thing that, has been around uh, humanity since you know we started to realize our own existence, which is consciousness. Yes, we haven't yeah. resolved the hard problem of consciousness, and that to me is the biggest mystery in that that humankind needs to solve. And I think, unfortunately, when humanity or at least Western society as by and large sort of took on the materialist mantle and decided that, you know, uh, I think this is even true for a lot of people who identify, you know, uh, religiously as, you know, with one of the major religions that, you know, they believe the brain is that like that's that is it. You know, that's that that's where things that's how things are happening. And so. 
when, you know, it's like saying, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy and I can't, but, uh, you know, it's, it's like trying to, it, you are completely limiting yourself by making that assumption. And I think it, it's that, that assumption, um, that is, you know, uh, which, which a lot of people have sort of like their life banked upon is this assumption, the certainty of science. And again, that yeah. goes back to the, you know, very well trod path of the, the religion of science. And you have, I mean, yes, you can do analysis of the brain. You can say, oh, if we poke part of this brain, someone sees the color orange. Okay, mm -hmm. but what's poking the brain in the first place if it's not you, you know? Like, right. yeah. it's the brain's an interpretive machine. And yes, yeah. certain things are going to correspond to other things, but that doesn't mean it's the source of those things. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that your own thoughts can somehow uh, manipulate and alter the wiring of your own brain, that's almost yeah. like it. <laughs> if you were to set your TV into a channel that is put that is running uh, some Western, and all of a sudden there's a bullet <laughs> that that flies from your, your set and kills you. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's not, this is not to throw away neurology and brain science because that, that's important to understand how these mechanisms work. Uh, but it's also important to realize that we do not know what consciousness is. And as much as you have materialists who will say we do, or we've pretty much figured it out. They they haven't, and if they are pressed on it, they can't answer the questions. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that you also have when dealing with UFOs and stuff the fact that there is, does seem to be a connection to our consciousness with this stuff, which would yes, which would make less sense if we were dealing with something that was just a physical nuts and bolts thing. Um, I mean, maybe the aliens are psychic, so maybe they can affect us on a conscious level, a consciousness level. Um, but you also have that liminality thing, you know, that people tend to have these experiences, as Je as uh, Jeffrey Kripal said, when we need them. V and and yes. throughout UFO, yeah. you know, research that has never been asked. Like people don't record yes. a UFO sighting and then go, "Well, what was going on in your life around this time?" You know, it was people like yeah. Jeff Ritzman and, and Hansen and stuff that started asking those questions to see what's the bigger picture. And I know, at least for me, my experiences generally did have liminal things going on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So how would yeah. liminality affect meeting an extraterrestrial? And I don't I don't think it's just liminality. I think that it's uh I would be hard pressed to find any person who has had a significant um, UFO experience, let alone paranormal experience, who has not had that change something about the way that they approach being a conscious being. Yes. And it could right. be a very small thing, but it's not like these aren't events like, you know, well, you could think of it in, in, in a sort of analogous, like, uh, okay, there are events that happen to you during your life and your normal day that are going to put you in a certain place. So, you know, you have like, you get in a car accident or you get this job or something like that. And these are events that happen to you that are significant and you understand that they're going to change your life. Well, you know, these paranormal events, they are uh, completely anomalous. Um, they are like the epitome of like hyper novelty, uh, as Terrence McKenna might say. Yeah. And the impact of that hyper novelty uh, s somehow, and this is only in a subjective way or maybe, you know, uh, a small collective way, impact. It's like a little push and it pushes them in some direction. And, you know, you'd have to do a lot of tracing back to see what these pushes sort of entailed, but something is happening that, uh, to me really, you know, it, 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 I start thinking back to, as we've said many times, the, the, uh, uh, control system, Valley's idea yeah. of a control system. When yeah. I, when speaking I, of Valley, uh, and, and picking up with your, your saying, Chris, uh, in his last book and other books, he has, uh, talked about 
the investigation he conducted about the Valenzuel case that happened in in, in France. Yeah, I want to say in the nineteen in nineteen sixty four or nineteen sixty five. Yep. I can't recall, but he uh, met and interviewed this uh, farmer who had this encounter on his uh, lavender lavender field. Farm, yeah. The lavender farm of, of these uh, the craft or object that descended and and, and settled on, on on his field, and there was these two beings that uh, one of them shot some kind of like ray that paralyzed him, and this was an event that really shook him and and Valet uh, really tries to. Make it, makes it clear to uh, the, his readers, this is a man who fought during World War II in the French Resistance. You know, so this is a guy who had faced yeah. numerous very risky uh, situations in his life. He like faced death, uh, you know, eye to eye, and hadn't flinched. So he had lived through it. But this event of meeting these entities had was the thing that really uh, scared him to death. And also, and this is something about that Valet points out in his books, changed his attitude toward life and also death. Like, for example, they were, Valet tells a story of he, they were talking about uh, the experience and they were walking and the guy showed him some wall when there was some vines that were growing and he said to Valet, look at all that life, you know, and tomorrow or in a few years, there will be nothing left. So this is a guy who, because of this experience, began to, to, to have a very different attitude toward what is to be alive, what is to, what happens to us after we cease to exist as we are now. Yes, this is this is the, the transformative aspect of the UFO experience that none of the people who are pushing for the ETH really talk about. Right. When right. Uh, when I first read Dimensions, because that was the first LA book I read, I was fully in the ETH camp. I mean, I don't remember what year it was, uh, maybe 89. And mm -hmm. I mean, I had read Communion. I had read uh, Bud Hopkins' uh, second book. I don't think I ever read Missing Time. But I think I started with Intruders. And I was, you know, I mean, these guys, not, not Whitley, but, but like someone like Bud Hopkins, very confidently asserted, this is extraterrestrial. Here's what they're doing. Here are all the answers. And then I'm reading Valet, and Valet's like comparing it to, you know, Fatima, comparing it to the, to the Faye, you know, culture and stuff. And I'm looking at that, and my brain is going, okay, so the aliens were also the fairies? The aliens were also, you know, like I didn't let go of the ATH. I just kind of put it on that framework, even though that's not what Valet was saying. That's how I interpreted it. And it took Kenneth Ring to show the personal changes in people who had UFO encounters and how they were very similar to people who had near-death experiences that my brain kind of stopped and went, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would... A, a, you know, dying and encountering an extraterrestrial have the same effect. And I think that was the first time I really understood that, oh, maybe they're not what they seem. Right. And um, now we have our friend, Josh Cutchin, who has just released right. his magnum opus, The Ecology of Souls, yes. available on Amazon <laughs> as a Kindle or as a paperback. Guys, get it. And He's pushing those arguments even further. You know, he's trying to make those connections. The connections, the the, the pulling the threads that are not of any interest by the people who are behind the ETH agenda. And yeah, saying there is a connection not only between the UFO phenomenon and consciousness, but also between the UFO phenomenon and what we humans call death. Right. It's the same thing that uh, Anne Striver, the late wife of uh, writer and UFO experience with Striver, once said to him after scoring through hundreds, if not thousands, of letters that they received after uh, Whitley published his book Communion. Right. Yeah, the, the quote was, uh, this has something to do with death. 
Yes. Yeah. And again, we don't know what life and death are. I mean, we, we can define them, you know, by, by material means, um, but we don't really understand them. Uh, we just exactly. we just have those definitions. You're dead when the life, quote, seems to leave your body. But what is that? Is that your consciousness? Yeah. Uh, is yeah. it something else? Is there, yeah. are there multiple things connecting together to create this, this thing that we call life? Yeah. And there are some people that when faced with that question, I think that is not something that they're interested in. You know, either they think that, you know, it's not something that they want to handle, um, uh, which is perfectly understandable, like not wanting to be thinking about things in terms of life and death or sure. consciousness. Sure. Uh, I think there's some people who are going to who are going to feel like that veers too far into religion. Um, uh, cause I think there's some people, there are a lot of people that have had bad experiences with a religion and, you know, uh, rightfully so. Cause I think, you know, there's a different, big difference between religion and maybe the, the things that prompted those institutions that existed there. You know, we all know that. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that these are, um, I don't know, things to consider, uh, uh, you know, being more, um, uh, impactful or influential than uh uh they are but some people just you know that's not the way that they're gonna be comfortable looking at it yeah like you said soraya we really don't understand what life and death are like we are losing life every day of our existence like like for example my hands have nails that grow larger and eventually have to you know trim them does that mean that i need to uh like celebrate some kind of like funerary uh <laughs> service every time that i you know have to trim my nails and have to mourn all those millions of cells that are living my body you know that are dying uh and at the same time right now uh people are listening to our voices and ideally this recording will still exist even after our bodies cease to exist you know, or cease to function, the better way to put it. So does that mean that people listening to this uh, audio recording will get to have some part of us inside their heads living there <laughs> for a while at least? <laughs> you know, does that mean that we're going to live inside the heads of millions? Well, Okay, millions, maybe it's a bit uh, pretentious. <laughs> Let's say hundreds, maybe thousands. Yeah. Let's say By the thousands time we're dead, people. it is millions. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. billions and billions, like Carl Sagan said. And, and you, you consider every cell in your body after nine years has been completely replaced. Yeah, exactly. So there's a map holding these things in place. You know, but the the actual material is completely different. It's yeah. funny that it, it, the, you talking RPJ about the 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 audio and you know it, the recording being some sort of um uh, uh like spectral version of us. I mean, this is the way that a lot of people were thinking around the turn of the nineteenth century about the technologies of audio and photographic and film recording and it was really right. intimately tied with uh spiritualism and seances uh you know and tied both in sort of a tricksterish illusion way but also tied in a very real way and that there were people that felt like this was you know you were providing life after death and i think we're having that conversation again with the idea of ai like if you're able to map somebody's memories you know it's all the stuff all the black mirror stuff you yeah, see going yeah yeah mm -hmm. and, I, and i don't think it's that simple i don't think you can just you know turn a brain into code and have a person no you know there's no. a ghost in the machine and without that ghost you don't have the person yeah, yeah. um so it was one of my uh patreons was actually uh is one of the people who started the et conversation with me in a very you know uh pleasant way um, and I just wanted to read what he wrote so we can address, you know, make sure we're addressing everything here. And he said, um, he really liked the Charles Lear interview. He said he was very open-minded, but grounded in his approach. 
Uh, he said, I feel like he was as open to the non-materialist other dimensional hypothesis as Soraya is close to the ET nuts and bolts hypothesis. And then he put a little smiley face. And he said, really, I get the pushback against the nuts and bolts crafts. I do, but the anti-nuts and bolts groupthink on the podcast is perplexing at times, especially when that seems like the most logical answer. As Soraya has noted, more than one explanation can be true. We can have both nuts and bolts crafts as rare as they may be or not be, uh, along with other dimensional phenomena on a nice, broad, fully inclusive spectrum of the phenomena that allows for discussions devoid of fairly reaching speculation just to avoid a seemingly likely nuts and bolts explanation. Um, and he commented he loves the show and stuff. Uh, like I said, it wasn't a hot, you know, and in any way a hostile uh, comment. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think part of it is like you, you personally, Soraya, it's just not how you feel, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily know if it's group think as much as, you know, uh, having similar people, you know, some of us have similar ID, you know, ideas and that's, you know, the, the, usually people you have on are kind of friends of yours, you know, with in these areas and, you know, some of our friends, we, you know, have similar ideas about things. Um, and I think it's not, you know, I guess there's nothing about the ETH uh, for me personally. And this is you're talking about a guy who's in his, you know, uh, somewhere in the mid to later part of his 40s who has been, you know, looking at this stuff since he was in grade school in the library looking at UFO books. And uh, I guess for me, I've done enough exploring of it that I don't feel that going down the nuts and bolts uh, avenue is going to yield anything more worthwhile or stimulating for my curiosity. Uh, because I don't think from all the evidence that I've seen, the numerous things that I couldn't list, because you're talking about, you know, 30, you know, some odd years of absorbing this material, you know, exactly what those are. If you, you know, let me, gave me some time, I could come up with it. But um, I also don't feel like I need to argue. Like, I think it's fine to look at it that way. But I guess, uh, you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts conversation also, too, right now doesn't seem to be set in a uh, sort of group of people or a group uh, of influencers that I really think are doing anything worthwhile like nuts and bolts seems led by like like lou elizondo like isn't he the king of nuts and bolts right yeah, now pretty I much. Don't know. and that doesn't mean to say some people can't be interested in it and not be like lou heads but it's just not you know i don't feel like there's much there uh quite frankly yeah what i see in the people who push the 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 eth is people who want easy digestible answers a lot of people who want to believe in a Star Trek kind of fantasy. Mm -hmm. The idea, oh yeah, these these are more advanced civilizations are coming to us. They don't interact to us because they are under some kind of like prime directive that prevents them from uh, tampering with cultures that are less advanced than them. But the moment that we show ourselves to be worthy, we will be... uh, Welcome to the Galactic Federation, and then, you know, a new uh, tomorrow will begin. You know, the, the fantasy of uh, you know, this like Star Trek, uh, and, and that's to me it seems to be so simplistic. Like I said, they leave up, they, they they leave out so much kind of strangeness data that is part of the of the UFO experience, mm-hmm. uh, and not only that, but uh, their their ideas uh like i said they're, they're, they're too simplistic like like for this this person saying well the, may, there may be an eth com- component to the ufo mystery yeah there may be you know i remember uh, back in the early 2000s there was this movie called final fantasy which was kind of breakthrough because it was one of the first cgi uh, totally yeah, CGI yeah. movies that came out and in some ways it was very revolutionary and part, very loosely based on, on the Final Fantasy video games but the idea was basically that there was some kind of like uh, meteorite that crashed to Earth and from it came out uh, 
uh, alien beings, but they were not really living. They were alien ghosts, you know. Mm. So, uh, the, so basically, that's what I see in in the people who who push for the ETH are number no, number one. There's there's very simplistic uh, solutions. And number two, there's this arrogance or there's this clinging to the physicalist paradigm and say, no, yeah, but all this can be easily explained without uh, going with uh, ideas that are, you know, too exotic, which is kind of uh, ironic because if you take a good look, a good hard look to the Star Trek uh, franchise, even the original series, you see that on numerous occasions, they portray uh, the encounter of you know the, the the Enterprise crew with beings that are so advanced that, for any lack of uh, any better word, they are gods. Space you know, gods, yep. The space yeah. gods that are capable of, of doing things that, for all intents and purposes, it's magic. You know, like oh yeah, we can we can bring you your, your dead wife. With a snap of our finger, yeah, know? and 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 the Star Trek, the, the people who are in the U, that DTH camp, they don't say, "Hey, I object to that," but they are perfectly cap- happy with that. But if you talk 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 to them about uh, the Star Wars and the Force, that's what they say. Nah, but that's that's not really sci-fi. You know? That's uh, <laughs> just fantasy. <laughs> now, the thing too that I think is worthwhile mentioning is the idea that. Uh, material and like extraterrestrial don't necessarily have to be the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, this idea of the of nuts and bolts or materiality, I think it's quite possible and, and it's actually quite probable that a lot of this phenomena is indeed some sort of physical or it manifests and it must because people are interacting with it. So there is a physicality to oh, it. Definitely. I just don't think that that physicality is based upon the kind of silicone transistor digital technology that we have now. I don't think it's based upon some kind of Star Trek style technology uh, yeah. because there has been nothing to show us that. I don't think there is any evidence, and I don't think that's the the simplest answer. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I had responded to Jack saying some of the stuff that uh, I said here, um, and he did respond and said, um, he said, I agree with and appreciate your points. The phenomena is far too varied to be simple ET nuts and bolts answer. But sometimes, to my mind, and despite the stigma justifiably attached to it by more enlightened segment of our community, it fits better than most anything else. Allowing for ET craft drones also seems more genuinely representative of the infinite nature of life, the multiverse, and everything. Uh, I say drones because it's hard to imagine an enormously advanced civilization bothering too much with actual manned expeditions. In fact, I'd be kind of surprised if the tech used wasn't entirely automated, including synthetic humanoids commonplace and low low tier in their technology hierarchy to the point where it's considered disposable way out on a speculative limb here but that's part of the fun so yeah and i also i don't think i I, at least for me i don't feel like i'm more enlightened it's you know it's it's we're talking about something that's so ephemeral like i don't I, i i don't think there's any need there's no like high or low or better for me or worse if you're really like at least in the way that he is thinking about it you know this pretty you know this jack he said his name is yes i mean it sounds like he's he's trying to think of stuff you know and uh, in the way that all of us are yes. I, I don't think yeah. he's being you know willfully uh uh yeah no i, I don't know. No, I don't even know what no. i'm saying i'm just saying like i think that like that sounds that's a i love i like hearing that i've heard yes. that before and um uh, I think it's certainly more possible than like actual physical ET bodies coming in a craft. Absolutely, man. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. Well, I, at the same but, time, we're we're interpreting the phenomenon based on our, our biases. You know, the yeah. biases of our oh, culture. Yeah. Right now, yeah. right now, the bias of our culture is the idea that uh, it is better to send uh, artificial intelligent constructs to do the hard work for us yeah. you know to send yeah. uh, the satellite to say to send the drone 
instead of uh, risking uh, you know, one of us. Uh, and I, I think it's it's really kind of fascinating that we're starting to see stuff that behaves more like that, and people are thinking that more and more. Yeah, but at the same time, I remember, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, of Frank Herbert's right. uh, Dune novels, and, it, and in the, the sci-fi universe he constructed, that's totally the opposite of what, what he uses. The idea is that, no, uh, at one point, humanity in their development realized that they should better get rid of any kind of uh, thinking machines that could replace uh, a human. So everything that happens in their world is uh, is is made by humans. Even the idea right. of uh, trying to navigate through the stars, they are using humans to do that. It's like you know? these freakishly mutated humans. Yeah, freakishly human mutated humans, but they are using. Uh, this uh, drug, the spice melange, in order yeah. to expand their consciousness and to have this, like, uh, almost like a prescience. Well, there is prescience trying to see into the future so they could see how Earth, they could uh, get their spaceship uh, safely. I mean, right. if I was if I was uh, a CIA agent uh, in the 1940s and 50s, 60s, that's what I would have been trying to do, like... <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what they try to do. Hence, yeah. they start right. get, uh, yeah. remote yeah. viewing yeah. spy yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Jack's comments were were you know that that was a really positive comment to me. But some of the ones yeah. on YouTube were you know oh yeah you guys just won't even consider the ETH. And I've heard it enough where I figured it was it was good to comment on why. Like Josh and sure. I, and I don't remember sure. if you were in on it, Red Pill. Like f quite a few years ago, we did. A show on why we don't go to the ETH idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, now I figure this is a good, you know, this was a good time where I've been hearing that enough that this is a good time to address why we don't mm -hmm. uh, go there very often. And like I said, mm -hmm. it's not that it's impossible. We don't know what it is. So we can't rule anything out. It's just right. to my mind, when you look at the big picture, that explanation doesn't hold much water. It doesn't yeah, mean that too small. huh? It's too small. It's yes, too small. Yeah, yeah. And it and some of those cases could be actual extraterrestrials. And like I said, the 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 asteroid there, Chris, the name of it, Amoa Moa. That's it. For some reason, I can't. You, you got to think of that. Uh, what's that song? Uh, it's like the kid song from uh, Sesame Street, Mana Mana. Ah. It's like that, a moa moa. I mean, that very well could be extraterrestrial that tells, technology. That tells you that I, I have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's not it's not out of the question. It's also the least interesting explanation, I think, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. everyone else is exploring huh. that. You know, 90% of the people talking about UFOs are still on the ETH stuff. So mm -hmm. that's why we really don't go there. Well, if there was more, I think it could be interesting if it was just like if it wasn't more of the same recycled, you know, I don't know, somebody go read Adam Go Rightly's book and just it's like recycled conspiracy that yeah. comes, yeah. you know, and I'm talking about like the sort of nuts and bolts ETH scene, you know, it, it it's the same stuff. And if something really amazing that is not part of that same recycled stories group of stories came out that was uh uh you know more nuts and bolts like somebody from al you know visitors from alpha centauri i would be interested in in, in hearing about that but yes. it's it's so recycled yeah yeah. It's, it, yeah we're talking about that because back in the 30s and 40s there were all these writers who started to to to, to put out publish uh, uh you know, short novels and stories on, on pulp magazines, like amazing stories. That's the thing that began to, to shape the culture. And that, and yeah. the thing that people like Donald Kehoe read uh, before they noticed all these reports of, of uh, strange things, flying saucers that began to, to hit uh, the news wires in the United States in the 1940s. And they made the conclusion, Oh, those has to be the same spacecraft, like the ones that Flash Gordon uh, right. writes in in the, the the serial comics that I used to read back in back when I was uh, fifteen years old, and, and that's only the only reason that we're, why we're talking about uh, the ETH. 
and why why we in our hubris, in our Western modern hubris, think it's the more uh, parsimonious explanation for for the UFO phenomenon. Uh, but it's not the case at all. First of all, it hasn't been proven. No, and it's and it will be very difficult to prove it, mind you. Even if you have, even if you had in your possession an actual crashed flying saucer in your backyard or in Angar 18, it will be extremely difficult to uh, prove the provenance of that craft unless uh, it read, you know, made in Alpha Centauri, or if you put some kind of like sensor in the craft before it departed, if, and, and, and it, uh, you follow it and you tracked it, and maybe 50 years later you say, oh, you know what, now I'm tracking it, and it is, yes, and it is in Andromeda, Andromeda Galaxy, so I guess they, they are from, you know, from other planets after all. That's the only way you will be well, able to actually show, prove without a uh, trace of a doubt that they are extraterrestrial craft. I would think that if it was made of stuff that you can't find on Earth, that would be evidence of extraterrestrial origin. Mm, I don't know. It's debatable. I mean, I, I, I think it's of some kind of... I feel it's an easy sci-fi trope, the idea that, oh, yeah, this is something that is outside the, the periodic table, of, uh, therefore it's extraterrestrial, but... Maybe the idea of the periodic table is that those are the same things that are uh, populated or, or, or you can, yeah, that you could find elsewhere in the cosmos. Like right. astronomers use uh, spectrometers and all those instruments and they, they, they peer into these stars that are, you know, millions of years away from us, and, and therefore they are millions of years younger than our galaxy, and they see the same uh, components, basic components, you know, they see carbon, they see helium, they see hydrogen. Sure. They don't see, oh, you know, there's an obtainium there. Uh, so well, unless it, this is a, a, some kind of like synthetic component that uh, we haven't developed here on Earth, uh, I don't know. I feel that, uh, and, and, and also remember that all those uh, samples that have been analyzed by people like Gary Nolan and, and Jacques Vallée, they don't show they are made with an obtainium. They are show with magnesium and, yeah. and, and aluminum, you know, in different kind of uh, isotopic ratios, you know, that are uh, uncommon. But it's the same stuff that we're made of. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's also possible there's stuff out there that we don't know to look for, that we don't, yeah. that we can't measure, that yeah. could be utilized in some way that, you know, uh, obviously, since we don't even know to look for it, we can't imagine. I mean, and, think of the yeah. alloys that were like, you know, uh, there was steel and iron, of course, but now, you know, there's titanium um, and who knows, maybe somebody will be able to invent adamantium at some point. Um, now, the, it's enough in the uh, public uh, zeitgeist with the new release of Marvel X-Men stuff. Yeah. People mm -hmm. start talking about adamantium and the world will be thinking about adamantium so much. That somewhere in, uh, you know, uh, Nairobi, a scientist will invent adamantium. <laughs> vibranium. Vibranium. There you go. Yeah. So I, th I think if, if you had something that showed to have fallen from the sky, seemed to be of intelligent design, a craft of some sort, and had, and it was made of things that we don't understand, I think we could, at least, you know, not definitely, because it's hard to say anything's definite, but we could at least suggest reasonably that's extraterrestrial. And we don't, we don't have that with the UFO phenomena. We have crashed saucers, most of which seem to be uh, hoaxes. Or, right. We, we don't have, we have stories of crash saucers. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like Roswell. I mean, Roswell was not a thing until the 80s. Nope. Like it, it, it's not, you know, I think people mistake things like Roswell as, oh, all this time we thought something crashed at Roswell. No, it came and went and it was forgotten yeah. and it got brought back up from disinfo agents in the 1980s. Yeah, to be fair, uh, Leonard Stringfield is a UFO researcher in the, in the 60s and 70s. He uh, gathered all, a lot of uh, uh, interviews and, and stories from ex-military personnel, ex 
claiming to have witnessed crushed uh, saucer operations, not in Roswell particularly, uh, like like you say, that's something that uh, Stan Friedman like right. rediscovered by right. serendipity uh, in the 1980s. But no, there was all these, these stories, uh, crushed saucers. One of them came from Mexico, you know, like my country. Mm. So that was part of the zeitgeist by the 1970s. But like you said, no conclusive evidence. Like Stringfield found, found those people and those people talked to him because I think he also had a military background. So I guess they they trusted him, but there's there was no conclusive evidence. And even Jacques Vallée in his journals writes about trying to follow those uh, stories but never finding any conclusive evidence, but finding a lot of people within the intelligence community, within the government, who thought those stories might be true. Yeah. So you see, there, there is this, it's almost like there's a Pandora box or maybe one of those Russian dolls of people who are inside the government and they feel that there is someone who is higher than them or, or you know, in, more inside the, the know-how than them, then those are the guys who are the, the real keepers of the UFO secrets. And they, the, the only thing they're trying to do is to try to get into those inner circles. But once they get into the inner circles, they, real, they realize, oh, these guys don't have the... the the UFO secrets, but they believe there's another group <laughs> that have the UFO secrets. So they keep chasing th these tales and tales, and they keep you know, opening the Russian laws over and over until they realize, oh, it's all hearsay. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're out of time. Can you guys stick around for a Patreon? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, Red Pill, where can people find you? Uh, in my house, crying because I haven't finished... <laughs> <laughs> the UFO tarot cards, but I am in the process of finishing them. Virtually, where can people find you? Virtually, they can find me here at uh, Where Did the Road Go? Uh, there are probably, Jesus, how many? A dozen? Probably more than a dozen. Well, uh, well more than a dozen shows with you. Well, more, right? <laughs> and I'm also on, at the Daily Grail www.dailygrail.com and also they can find my personal uh, website absurdbydesign.com and Chris? Oh, similar uh, uh, to, to RPJ you can find uh, a, if you want similar stuff from me you can find it here uh, otherwise you can go to brightrectangle.com where I do my film stuff all right thank you both thank you mm -hmm. I want to take a moment here and thank all of my Patreons for making Where Did the Road Go what it is. I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Chuck Shutters, Leanne Cherry, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, CJ, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, Chris Ernst, Greg Parmenter, Crystal Ann Compton, Diane B., Edu Camahort, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, Jim Pyre, Joanna Rojas, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Anne Witowski, Kevin, Kevin Schreck, Cool Kitty, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Linz Jackson K, Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Jim and Sophie, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Patricia W, Paul Jeffries, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Ron Dupre, Sam Sheeran, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Stephen D., and Amber Hall. Thank you all so very, very much. If you enjoyed that conversation, there's a quite lengthy Patreon extra from that that will go up this week. Also, if you're a patron, you get shows a week early, um, unless we do something like the Swapcast with the Snake Brothers we recently did, uh, in which case you only get it a few hours early. But normally you get shows a week early, plus extra content most of the time. And special little gifts here and there. Only $3 a month, and you can become a patron at wheredidtheroadtogo.com. Just click on the big Patreon link. See you next time.
You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.